Hi, this is Zulfikar Ramzan, and I'm the Chief Scientist of SourceFire's Cloud Technology Group. So given all this attention that's been garnered by this most recent Java zero-day vulnerability, I thought I would do a video so that you can see or get a bit of a higher level visual regarding what typically happens in these cases. My colleague Alfred Huger and his really excellent team, they set up a system that's running a connector for SourceFire's FireAmp advanced malware protection technology. And that system has a fully patched and up-to-date version of Java on it. They then took that system and then had it connect to a test site that contains the actual exploit code. Now, for those of you who may not already know, this latest Java vulnerability basically allows a malicious applet, or malicious Java applet rather, to completely circumvent Java's existing security mechanisms. And the result is that an attacker can run arbitrary malicious code outside of the Java sandbox, where it can pretty much run uninhibited. Now, at a more technical level, this vulnerability appears to be uh, somewhat similar to this vulnerability CVE 2012-4681 from last August, and I actually made a Chalk Talk video describing the mechanics of CVE 2012-4681 that you can find by going to SourceFire's YouTube channel and looking under our Chalk Talk section. So let's imagine here a fairly typical incident response scenario. Here, an incident response analyst who is logged into the FireAmp management console notices that a particular system, which we have uh, conveniently called Java Zero Day for reasons that will either become very clear momentarily if they're not already clear. And what you'll notice is that this particular system has gotten infected with uh, what appears to be some variation of the zero access Trojan. All right. And this particular Trojan has been very popular. We actually have some chalk talks to describe it as well. And now what the analysts might want to do is they may want to, to drill into this particular system to see what they can unearth about its behavior. And as soon as the events load up, hopefully something uh, quite obvious becomes to emanate. A warning bell should ring because what you'll start to notice here is that the parent file for many of the events and many of the threats, it seems that java.exe is quite commonly the parent file. All right, and you know if we want, we can actually take a, a step back. We can actually look at the uh, threat root cause report that's produced for FireAmp, and what you'll start to see when you look at the threat root cause report for this particular environment, and these are mostly just test systems, you'll start to notice that uh, Java.exe is a very common threat root cause in this environment. All right. And so it's introducing a substantial number of threats. And what an analyst might then typically want to do is dig a bit deeper into uh, one of these systems. So we can use the trajectory feature within FireAmp to do that. And normally what I would do is I would type in, let's say, the name of a system here. But it, it turns out that the system in question, java-0-day, happens to have been a recent search item. So we can go ahead and click on it and take a look at what we're able to observe regarding this particular system. Now, what you'll start to see here is a snapshot, a fairly recent snapshot of what's happening on the system. And from this snapshot, you can see that servicehost.exe, which is a very standard Windows component, uh, is making a large number, a ton of outbound internet connections. And, and um, some of these connections seem to be going to some strange sites. Like, for example, this one is going to some hotfeed.net. There's a click.cgi. Uh, these are the kinds of sites that you would never expect let's say, uh, anything, uh, any standard Windows component like service host IDXC to go to. Um, and so clearly there's something suspicious happening here. And in this particular case, uh, it seems to be some type of a click fraud Trojan on the system. And, and by the way, a click fraud is a very common application of the zero access Trojan. So now what we can start to do is maybe rewind the tape, so to speak, to see what might have happened about, let's say, I don't know, 40 minutes earlier and already uh, when you look a little bit earlier, you start to notice some interesting behavior right here. Uh, and in particular, what's happening here is that uh, the user at, at this point ran the Google Chrome web browser, and then uh, Chrome itself uh, seems to have accessed uh, this particular site, 10.180.0.144. In this particular case, uh, this site happens to be one that we set up, and it contains exploit code for this latest Java zero-day vulnerability. Now what happens is that java.exe right here does kick off. And based on my understanding of the exploit, what's really happening underneath the hood, so to speak, is that the exploit is able to execute arbitrary code outside of 
the Java sandbox by effectively co-opting an existing object that's already running outside the sandbox where that object itself was, let's say, accessed by a Java class that was already loaded in memory. Okay, now once the exploit succeeds, the exploit code runs, and once it succeeds, uh, one of the first things that's happening is that java.exe proceeds to make an outbound network connection, and here it actually seems to be downloading a copy of uh, zaccess.exe, which uh, again, it's, it's a, uh, a, a version of the zero access trojan. And then this zaccess.exe is executed, and uh, it basically does its usual things, like typically what zaccess.exe will do, it'll typically go to j.maxmine.com right here, and then it'll typically go to 8.8.8.8, um, .8 which is the uh, IP address for Google's public DNS service. All right, and then afterwards, it basically seems to be pulling in and trying to create a number of different files on the system and, and kind of continues to go about doing a number of, of interesting behaviors. And then eventually, um, eventually, service society XC becomes co-opted and starts to make a large number of outbound internet connections. All right, and, and if you look at some of these connections, for example, uh, here it seems to be going to this URL uh, U L R O Y and a bunch of random looking letters. Uh, in this particular case, it's probably reporting back some central information to a central server, and this is uh, most likely Base64 encoded uh, information. Uh, and basically, from that point onward, a number of repeated connections are being made on, and so on and so forth. Now, I think the key point, the key point here is that you have to understand the threat root cause rather than just focusing on threat symptoms. And although we started this exercise by identifying a piece of malware running on the system, it quickly became clear that Java was being exploited. And that exploit was a source of the problems that machine experienced. Now, knowing this, the incident response team can decide, hey, you know, we, let's completely block all Java execution until a patch is made available. That's actually pretty easy to do. Uh, within FireRamp, you can go to Outbreak Control, click on Application Control and Blocking, and then go ahead and you can click on Create and Create a blocking capability to block this particular application. And then once the uh, patch is made available, you can go ahead and unblock it. You just have to enter the information about the application right here. All right, and it's actually very simple to do. And it gives you an opportunity to now to wholesale protect yourself against all the threats that might be emanating from this one vulnerability for the time being. So hopefully this video gave you at least a partial high-level view into this latest Java zero-day vulnerability and some of its ramifications.